And so we are here for the second part of our discussion of the best CG animation. And of course, I couldn't do this alone. I had to have my friend Matt Brunet here. Matt, thank you so much for doing this. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I mean, we got we got a lot more animation to talk about. And I mean, as animation fans, of course, we could go on and on and on. And as proof, yes. well, we got to split it into two parts. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, so, all right, what do you have next? Uh, my next up, well, I mean, technically, I just went through uh, Puss and Boots, The Last Wish. Okay, I actually have an interesting one coming up. I have the Lego Batman movie. Oh, like okay. I know the... I know a lot of people would go and put in the Lego movie in general. And I mean, I do agree. Definitely a solid film right there. And I have that. I but, have that on my list. Lego movie. Uh, I have that coming up. <laughs> all right. So I'll, I'll explain my, then I'll save my piece on the Lego movie for later. <laughs> but with the Lego Batman movie, it's basically what you get with the Lego movie, but you get so much more. In fact, this might be a bit of a hot take. I feel like the Lego Batman movie has established that super, you know, that animated superhero genre and has done a lot of what Spider-Verse did before that movie came out. Because in a way, it's simultaneously both a satire and a, a celebration of Batman's entire legacy. And at the same time, you kind of go through this like silly Lego-like adventure of Batman, but it's also debatably one of the most, or debatably the most heartfelt Batman movie that you could find. And speaking of that theme of family, that's what it really encompasses. It's Batman uh, trying to come in terms that he is lonely and wants to have his own family. The fact that he, it's something that he barely had much experience because of, well, the story that we know of what happened to his parents and stuff like that. And while he's living his best life as Batman and stuff, um, he's having a hard time trying to move forward without having, you know, some people to accompany him outside of Alfred, you know, just to, you know, just to live life and be happy with others, uh, rather it be with, um, you know, rather it be having like either a wife or a girlfriend yeah. or having a kid. And his bromance and with the Joker. Oh, yeah. That, oh my God. That is actually a lot of fun. Like you see, yeah, like that kind of dynamic where you kind of see them as a couple. That is actually great. That is actually a, a lot of fun too. Uh, and then you also have Robin as well. Just like now, depict now is like full on depicted as just this fun love, you know, this optimistic fun loving kid you know kind of like uh kind of like going back to like those uh cliched boy wonder kind of tropes but you you can hear that with michael sarah he's just having like a lot of fun with it so just oh you know just over the top but just yeah. the right amount of over the top so i would say with um the lego batman movie I feel like it is a little bit underrated because of how it often gets overshadowed by uh, like movies such as Spider-Verse or uh, the original Lego movie. But I feel like it, it deserves to have, you know, it deserves to be mentioned. It deserves to have a spot to be considered among the best because of how it plays around, not just with the Lego with the Lego movie formula, but also bringing in that extra Batman element into it. And not to mention, and of course, speaking of which, uh, we, we got to talk about like the Will Arnett Batman. Like, yeah, they, you know, they, you know, they, they, they did well with introducing him in the first Lego movie, but this time around uh, showing, you know, showing his side of the story, uh, playing around with like that, goofy batman is just you know is definitely great and yeah it's great to see like um you, you know th to emphasize that you know that that parody of a batman now just brought to life and kind of fleshed out as his own character so yeah, yeah it, it, just all around great it's a really fun movie i really enjoy it i do think the first like 45 minutes is a lot stronger than the and then the ending gets a little convoluted and i think it's, it's interesting i think we're figuring out that like for me like i will almost always prefer like not necessarily like a formula but like i i really like sort of classic stories well told you know whereas i think you 
you value more like in ingenuity and inventive like sh- like sh- uh mixing it up as far as story like i you know like where i does that make sense i feel like I, yeah, that, I know, I know, that's I sort of a thing from. yeah yeah but anyway with so the reason why i would pick the first one is that i love the I love the way that it captures a child's play. I think it is the best movie I've ever seen at capturing the way a little child actually plays. Because when you play with a when you play with a little child, they everything's all mixed up. There's like a Barbie and there's a Star Wars character and there's a you know and they have it all mixed together and they don't care and it's all this whole story. And and I I think that that's really fun and it. And I think that a lot of the the uh, the original Lego movie kind of comes down to how much do you get invested in actually the live action portion versus the the some of the sequels because when when the we know that Will Ferrell's character is Lord Business you know in the in in the in this child's plaything Linus in the story he's the villain his dad is the villain and um and so this moment where they actually like he because he's he's you know he's got all these things of how how his son should play and how they how he should be using the legos and uh and but once he actually like sits down and actually plays with his son the way that his son plays and starts to really listen to him i think it's so beautiful and moving and um i i also think that there's a texture to this first one in the animation that you don't get in the sequels like just little things like when uh when the characters jump into the water you see the 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 legos go out and you lose that in um you lose that sense of it almost this almost you could believe it was stop motion uh i think mm-hmm. and uh it looks so convincing and they uh i they they kind of dropped some of that for the sequels and i could understand why because i'm sure that's just like a nightmare but um but uh following emmett on his journey of figuring out where he belongs in this in this world where he thinks that you know starts out thinks he's got everything all figured out and uh and then uh he he's he comes to learn what is his unique uh unique uh attribute that he can offer the world and i i really enjoy that story and um so yeah i i just think it's really uh a really you know special film and um and i love that live action scene i think it's so effective yeah i'll just go and put a bit of my piece on the lego movie i do you know i i do agree i think like with the storytelling, with how they would go and approach it as, like, a, a kid playing with Legos, that I do agree. Like, it's very, you know, very innovative um, with how they approach it, especially, like, as innovative as as the um, animation itself. Like, I remember then, it even fooled me, thinking that, like, part of, it was like, was part of it actually stop motion? No, it was all CG, so... Um, and especially with how, like, it, it, like when you look at every little detail, especially in the first film, that everything is made of Legos. That, like, every, like every little effect, every character, like, every yeah. piece of background, like, it's all made of Legos. They actually do work well. The way it moved and flowed was so beautiful. Oh, yeah. Like, they, yeah. they managed to work well. And not to mention, like, they have their own set of just crazy fun characters uh especially like i've already talked about you know like you got batman thrown into it like the like that that little extra mix of like pop culture references like it was it's actually fantastic and what what are the few movies i would say that actually did amazingly in terms of uh in- including pop culture references like even at a time when people are sick and tired of it like this actually found a way to make that legitimately work uh and ironically like you could tell this was before you know before disney entered into the scene because you know it, it's kind of funny how like there's a lot of them that technically they're owned by different companies like you got like there's the moment there's the star wars moment you've got millhouse having a cameo you even yeah. have a, a a ninja turtle uh that showed up in there uh but uh, i love the different also, lands like the pirate land oh and yeah the, it's really fun yeah 
I will say, <laughs> you know, I, like honestly, there's a part of me that wish that was like, I wish my, I wish part of my childhood could be like, could be satisfied if they could show up like a bionicle world, but that yeah, that's just me. Mm -hmm. But I will say the only thing that's holding me back, the, the one thing that I would say why I would place the Lego Batman movie above the first Lego movie, uh, like even though the storytelling itself is definitely awesome, I would say that the story itself, like in terms of the writing, it's okay. You know, I wouldn't say it's the best. It's just, you know, in terms of that, it's just fine. Like, yeah, they go, like, it is a bit more of the classic story. Uh, like they go a bit more into like this whole chosen one type narrative and uh and going through this uh this character like Emmett who's just like you know the ordinary guy and try to play around with that but I I, I don't know I, I think it adds a like layer get... though because the whole thing is really the child when you realize that his dad is the villain like it kind of adds a layer to me Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah, like I, I can definitely see see where you're coming from with that. Like, especially how it's at, like again, and that's like a massive part of the storytelling. It's just the character. Like for me, it's just the character himself of Emmett. It's just mm -hmm. like it's, eh, you know, it's like yeah, I can yeah. See that. It's like it's like they they pursued like trying to make him just the ordinary character, and like I feel like they succeeded that to a fault. It's like. Yeah, he's the ordinary guy, and it's like, oh, that that that's it, I guess. Okay, um, yeah. yeah, that's how I feel like with like with Emmett, he's not as like I don't feel like he's as memorable as some of like the others, rather it be like Lord Businessman or Batman or uh, more Freeman's character or Wild Style. Mm, I can see that. Yeah. Are you a fan of Rachel's reviews? Do you look forward to Family Movie Night, female film critics panels, or the Talking Disney podcast? If so, please consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron. As a patron, you get to access monthly events such as the watch alongs and Q and A's where you get to talk to stars and find out the behind the scenes of the movie making industry. And you can pick what I review for Family Movie Night or even become a guest on the podcast. Podcasts and YouTube channels are expensive and I really, really could use your help. I would so appreciate it. You also get to be a member of the Facebook group where we talk about all the films that we're seeing and we have so much fun. Go to patreon.com slash hallmarkies and select one of the Rachel's fan tiers. That's patreon.com slash hallmarkies. Are you up next? The uh, yeah. Went. Okay. Yeah. I yeah, lost like you, you, yeah. So what do you have next? Like a movie. Um, okay, I'm gonna go with one that honestly, this is the one that I feel like I was having a hard time figuring out what to go and include. So I decided to go with this. And I don't know if I if if I would do like a true top 50 best animated features, I don't know if I would include this one. But I figured, yeah, let's spice things up. I decided to go with the first Madagascar. Oh, uh, okay. So with, with the first Madagascar, I feel like this is the kind of film that even though it has a massive fan base, a lot of people love it, a lot of memorable scenes, I feel like it doesn't get as much credit in terms of some of the things that it would do that I feel like are actually pretty innovative. In fact, um, I, would, I would say that technically the first Madagascar film is the first, at least in terms of mainstream computer animated features, to go into a cartoony direction that like that you know back then when you think about the 2000s like they always tried to go for realism that they try to make the characters look as realistic as possible or at least have the setting you know like with cg it's all about trying to make things look real but with madagascar this is the first animated feature to take like the first steps in terms of just re rejecting a bit of that realism and just go a bit more cartoony like go into that looney tunes direction uh with its animation rather it be with the uh, the more wacky looking designs with all the different animals or especially comedy going a lot more slapstick going a lot more physical uh and a lot uh, going a lot more with uh crazy surprises with it and um that has played a very significant role as to why the comedy is absolutely golden in this and i would even say that uh, at least in terms of like 
uh, car like that cartoony style from the 2000s and even during the early 2010s, Madagascar is still among one of the better ones alongside Horton Hears a Who. So that's one thing I want to go and give it credit to. Uh, but also going back into the comedy, like it is very on point. I feel like it is great. And the kind where like it knows how to deliver like uh, a whole bunch of gags, like honestly, like a gag, you know, like a I guess second and like really make it consistently funny throughout, especially with each character delivering their own blood their own brand of humor rather it be with alex's ego uh or the flamboyance of king julian or like um the mil you know the uh military like espionage uh, of the penguins or the nervousness of uh of melman and uh, all, like and uh, not to mention like with the actors themselves uh delivering great comedy rather it be a uh, Chris Rock, Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, and, and many others. Like honestly, there there's just a lot. There's a wide variety of comedy that this would go and deliver, and they're all fantastic. And th there are even some of them that like they're highly memorable. Like it, it really is the kind of movie where you walk out with a handful of favorite gags that you are going to remember from this feature. And um, not to mention, there's also uh, some nice heart that goes into it. Like we've already talked a lot about, uh, you know, the theme of family. But in this case, uh, we're talking about the theme of home and who you're supposed to be as well. Where you got uh, Marty, who, who, so, who is longing to go and actually live in the wild. He doesn't want to be caged up in new york city he wants to experience you know to experience the kind of unique freedom that animals are supposed to be known for uh but then at the same time you also got alex who is way too used to his um reg you know his uh his caged life i i guess you could say in in uh, new york but then when he goes into uh the wild suddenly his instincts start to kick in and that is when it becomes so, and when he becomes so conflicted between, um, who does he you know, it, like? Does he wants? Does he want to be a wild lion or to be friends with, you know, the the people that he grew up with, like with uh, Marty Melon and Gloria? So honestly, it's it, it's one of the. It, it, I, I feel like with Madagascar, it's one of the great animated comedies out there. And I know there's like different feelings in terms of the second and the third one, and I'd even throw in Penguins of Madagascar as well. But I think the first one, a very solid standard of what this franchise would go and become. Yeah, I have not seen this movie in a long time, so maybe I'll need to revisit it. I think you sold it very well. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's been a decade since I've seen Madagascar. So, uh, so my next one is one I do think is pretty underappreciated. Um, it's, uh, the peanuts movie is my next choice. Um, uh, I was pretty nervous about this cause I love, you know, being a Christmas movie person, the Charlie Brown Christmas special is a favorite, um, of mine. And, uh, you know, I just, <clears throat> Uh, you know, it just makes you nervous. Uh, people, this beloved property, and are they going to be able to do it? And I, I just loved the way that they did it, and they kept the story very simple. And uh, and uh, Charlie Brown is just such a, uh, I think such a, a character that's so emotionally true. He 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 is very honest about how he feels in his response to, uh, to things, and I think that's why so many of us can relate to how Charlie Brown is feeling. And, uh, you know, he's just trying to get confidence. He's trying to be a winner, you know, throughout the course of the story. And uh, again, most of us can kind of relate to that and feeling awkward and, and depressed. And and uh, so I, I, I loved that. Uh, I thought it was funny and sweet. And I, uh, I absolutely love the animation. I think it didn't get quite the credit I think it deserves for being one of the first movies to have this sort of hybrid uh, animation, the sort of paper man aesthetic that we'd seen in shorts, but we hadn't really seen it in a feature. And the way they were able to capture the that sort of flat aesthetic of the comics, but um, and the and the uh, 
the animated uh, specials, um, they were able to capture that, but give it a CG kind of look as well. I think it's really cool. And um, I just, I just really love it. I think it's great. No, I completely understand where you're coming from. Honestly, it's been a hot minute since I've actually seen uh, the Peanuts movie, but yeah, I do feel like it is easily one of the best films from Blue Sky Studios. And I, I definitely do agree with you. One that does not get enough credit for the innovation that it has done, and especially in the animation. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, like, and I know we've already praised this movie a lot, especially in this video right here. But I feel like it's mainly because a lot of the credit has been given to Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, where a lot, where in a way, a lot of what the Peanuts movie did, Spider-Man would go and also do yeah. so, but then three years all, sooner. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And like get all the uh, attention from there. So, but I do, I, I definitely do get what you mean with uh, the Peanuts movie. Like, I know there's a lot of people who love Peanuts that. They love the wholesomeness that they have established, especially with the classic specials and with the comics and stuff like that. And they absolutely nailed it in, uh, in in the movie where you do have that simplicity, but it, it captures the charm of that simplicity of like this awkward kid just going through life, rather it be to impress this crush that he has or... Just, you know just to fit you know just to go and fit in with everyone just to yeah. you know just to be happy with himself you know there mm. there's that sense where you can relate to that awkwardness that charlie brown goes through and not to mention like the other elements that are fun to go and see uh be adapted as well especially with snoopy's adventures and he you know his flights going against the red baron and stuff like that and so, i like, like the you, fact you, that you, they yeah. had kids voice the characters that was really cool Oh, yeah, of course, you do have mm -hmm. that as well. And especially like going back to the animation, absolutely wonderful that they have done uh, basically making what <laughs> I guess you know, technically it's a term that gamers would use, but this 2.5D animation where it's done with like it's clearly done with CG, but mm -hmm. they but they kind of they kind of took some uh, took some steps of what the Lego movie did. And, and they decided to go and try to recreate a style that was previously established before. And they they did so very well. It really like the you know, like a lot of people wouldn't think this is how you would do a, a computer animated Peanuts movie. But yeah, Blue Sky really pulled an unexpected twist with this one. And it worked out very beautifully. Mm -hmm. So what do you have next? Ah, my next up. Well, we might as well go with something that is recent. I know we've talked about it quite a bit here. I know I've talked about it with you, Rachel. I gotta go with Nimona. A very recent addition, I know, but I just feel like it's one that it's just a fantastic movie. And I get, well, honestly. Well, I was surprised you didn't have that in your 2D. Like, would you consider that CG then? I mean, I guess you do. Nimona? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a CG film. Like it's absolutely mm -hmm. CG. It's just the style that it has done, of course, it you know, it, it does look 2D because it took, you know, that one took inspiration from what was previously done at Disney when they did those shorts like Feast and uh and Paper Man. In fact, I think mm -hmm. uh, the director of Feast, pa uh, Patrick Osborne, was yeah. the original director of Nimona when it was when it was still at Blue Sky Studios. Well, and I have one um, coming up that we debated too. Is it 2D? Is it CG? Uh, because no. every I mean every animated film uses uses computers these days. I mean, yeah. even if it looks yeah, it uses computers, but it's how you would go and use it. I mean, well, I mean, technically, like you could debate. I mean, you could debate that if Nimona would be considered 2D, just like if uh, the Peanuts movie would be considered 2D as well. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, animation still highly stylized, but still very beautiful to present this futuristic medieval world that kind of, you know, it feels like a mashup of different genres, but like actually work harmoniously well together. And not to mention uh, the character animation that they made them so lively and you could tell that they made the characters so 
so much fun and just bursting with life, especially with the character of Nimona themselves, with all the different transformations that they do into like a variety of animals that I'm sure a lot of animation fans have mentioned it, that it is very reminiscent to Disney's Sword in the Stone with Wizards Duel. And you see all these different transformations, but yeah. still maintain some elements that you could still recognize that it's those characters in particular. And then, of course, you do have the representation. And I would and I would so far say that this is the best anime movie in terms of having LGBTQ plus representation, not just with Nimona being an allegory of non-binary and trans people, but then you also have um, uh, Ballister, who is openly gay. And uh, especially the conflict that he would have with his boyfriend, throughout is just you know it, it adds this great layer of uh, the, in which it shows that what he is accused of is something that is considered like shocking and how it's affecting him personally and affecting his life and also affecting the life of others like it's a shocking thing but it but it actually makes this character very impactful as well and not to mention of how it plays into the role of discrimination i think this alongside zootopia are some of the best movies that discusses about that subject matter in a way that is fun that it is engaging and very thought-provoking as well that it reflects upon on what is happening in a real world too um very you know it, very well crafted and uh, really, and it's amazing, and especially with that message, in a way, it like makes the movie go into this slope that you know, like it at first it seems like you know very energetic, very fun, very funny, and all that stuff. But then suddenly, like you learn more and more about who Nimona is, and suddenly that's when the tragedy slowly creeps in, and you learn, you know, you learn about the history of the world that uh Nimona is set in you learn about the character of, of what they went through and like and, you know and suddenly you see this heartbreaking lair and it, it almost becomes like this completely different movie but still works out in its own way so yeah I know it is a very recent edition but I had to go and include this one it's yeah. just a, a fantastic film well, I'm so glad you did, and I'm so glad that they got to make it. I, I really am. I mean, it certainly deserved to to get finished, that's for sure. Um, well, my next one is one that I admit that I I just like uh, more than most people, um, and I that it just makes me laugh. I think it's really funny. Um, it is Mr. Peabody and Sherman. It's one that is kind of forgotten, but I think it is so funny. I love the script. It has so many good lines. Uh, I mean, maybe it helps that I'm not like super attached to the original uh, series, you know, but um, I uh, that uh, I I like that he says, don't you get me started on Oedipus. Needless to say, you don't want to be at his house over the holidays. And in my opinion, they get married way too young in ancient Egypt, or perhaps I'm just some old Giza. <laughs> uh, he says, but we've already paid for the catering. And uh, too bad you are going to lose your deposit for the sacrificial offering. I, I was talking to the sun god Ra the other day, and he told me he changed his mind. Old flip flop Ra, we call him over here in the underworld. <laughs> Oi again with the plagues. Why did we move to Egypt? <laughs> uh, yeah, I love Petty. And she's like, can it go back to an hour ago because I could take it home, pretend to be sick, and not come to this lame dinner party? <laughs> Um, Dang, you got is that all memorized mr peabody he says no i have in my review um he oh. says uh mr peabody i hate her uh, every relationship starts from a point of conflict and evolves into something richer <laughs> um i don't know i just love it i think it's really funny and i i really like the animation and if i were making a list of of movies i think are underrated it would be that for me because I think it really delivers on the laughs and you know they're collecting all of these sort of characters throughout history and and so that's fun you know you can kind of teach kids about all these different you know people and and um it also has like a decent little story about 
uh, about Mr. Peabody and, you know, raising Sherman and, and uh, your chosen family again. I mean, that's a theme that just works for me a lot. Um, but I, in the end, it just, I just think it's really funny as good voice work. So you, yeah, you know, I, it's I just, my random pick. You may say that it's random, but slowly but surely I've been seeing more and more people say the same thing that you have just said. Like I, I I'm getting this feeling that like, even though it started out as a massive box office bomb and a very yeah. disappointing one too, um, it looks like slowly that mr peabody and sherman might find its audience i'm like there is a chance it could be the next uh road to el dorado and i'm not i I, i'm just gonna say that like i'm not a massive fan of the movie like i'm not saying that it's amazing like honestly i feel like with the addition of penny it's just kind of eh but i will give it that when the movie tries to be like Mr. Peabody and Sherman, like the classic Jay Ward cartoons, that's when it's really at its best. Like adding in the history, you know, adding in the elements of history, the dynamic between Mr. Peabody and Sherman as uh, as the characters. And uh, when you bring in the personalities, like really livening up uh, the historical figures, that's when it really is a lot of fun. And when you do have a lot of uh, memorable moments within the feature and a lot of great gags that are present. So uh, I, I feel like with uh, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, for me, I don't consider it to be the best DreamWorks film out there, but it definitely has its golden moments. And honestly, a, like a lot that I feel like deserves to be highlighted so mm -hmm. yeah I, I i kind of feel happy that there's more and more people that are opening up that they actually do enjoy the film because i agree it definitely is an enjoyable feature that you know deserves to have a second chance because there's a lot of fun things that you yeah. can actually find in this movie and it would be like if i was going in my order it would be number 10 so you know the end of my list but uh since we're doing alphabetic Oh, order it came in the middle but uh but yeah i i think it deserves if people haven't checked it out give it a watch maybe you might you know humor is so subjective but i i, I think it's pretty funny and i think ty burrell is great in the vocal oh, yeah. he's really good hey this is david from the piecing it together podcast a podcast about movies and the movies that inspire them for over four years each week a guest and i take a look at a new movie through the lens of what other movies we think were either an influence or connect in some other way it's a fun unique way to discuss films that leads to a great list of other movies to check out that either explore the same themes and ideas or maybe utilize similar filmmaking techniques including special episodes in our side series that twist the format. We've done over 200 episodes, so there's bound to be one on a film you've been thinking about and want to dig deeper into. So check us out on all the major podcasting apps and at piecingpod.com. Um, all right, what do you have next? Well, my next up, um, well, well, technically it would have been Puss in Boots the Last Wish, but we've already talked about that. But instead, we are going to talk about Shrek 2. Mm. Uh, and with Shrek 2, I feel uh, with this one, it's one of the best animated sequels that you can go and find. And one thing that especially works for me is that this is one of the best animated romantic films, or at least in terms of how they present the romance between Shrek and Fiona it is wonderful. Because this is one of those films that, you know, one of those uh, fairy tale movies that tries to answer the question, what happens after Happily Ever After? And it, it actually shows you with Shrek and Fiona on a legit, like in an actual newlywed relationship where you see them together, where you see, you know, you see uh, mm -hmm. how their, you know, how their love bloomed uh, ever since the first movie. And then they would get this invitation to go and see Fiona's parents and you go to the kingdom of far, far away. And from there, you see the additional challenges that these two have to face, especially when there is some some prejudice conflict between uh, the parents and with Shrek. And how do their, you know, how, how do their love face those challenges and stuff like that? And what I love about it is that you could tell that even during those tough times, like even when uh, things are very difficult between Shrek and his parents and even 
between the dynamic between Shrek and Fiona, you could tell that throughout they still love each other and that even like during those tough choices that the like every like their actions are motivated because they want to maintain that love they know that like it like the best thing that happened to them in their lives is having each other and they don't want to go and break that which results in some beautiful heartfelt scenes and some very strong character dynamics so that actually works out very so they actually worked out amazingly in that and then not to mention of course you've got the comedy and some of the other characters as well again um th this is one of the best examples of using pop culture references uh for, you know showing up in the world you know having a great you know establish the world building of far far away kind of like making it this medieval beverly hills slash hollywood yeah, yeah i love that uh, and then of course like you got great characters that that are from uh, amazing voice actors of course like you got donkey with eddie murphy coming back doing doing his regular shtick that uh he just adds more memorable scenes into it and then of course well uh we gotta bring back puss and to this with his official intro uh and I, in which i've said for a long time like barring robin williams and the genie i think that antonio banderas is like maybe the most perfect casting of an actor for a role in in, in Puss in Boots is absolutely perfect. You know, it's not one of those celebrity voices that doesn't like it's the perfect choice. Yeah, yeah, he actually did amazingly well with Puss in Boots, like going from this bounty hunter to ally, but still maintaining that cat element into it. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, like really adding in to um, to the fa and then there's also like the world building with the fairy tale aspect. Like, of course, they've already did it a lot with the first Shrek. But this time around, instead of just being like a whole slam on classic Disney movies, they started to lean a bit more on just trying to be its own thing a little bit. Like, yeah, you do have a few jokes and a few slams on uh, on Disney's, uh, you, know, you know, like on, on Disney. But at the same time, like now they focus a lot more on taking fairy tale elements and trying to develop their own story even like with other characters like with uh the fairy godmother um like portraying her as like a full-on villain and in a way trying to control the fate of everyone in a way she's yeah. kind of like this mafia boss where she's not necessarily the leader of the land but how she runs her operations with granting wishes stuff like that she like she's ultimately the one who would go and try to make to make rules and that she is trying to find her way in order to gain more power and far, far away by having her son, Prince Charming, marry Fiona. Yeah, it's a really strong film. Uh, and, I, you know, it's so interesting because DreamWorks almost always their uh, their second movies are the strongest in most of the series. You know, I'm an odd, I, I'm an outlier that I like the first How to Train Your Dragon, but it's certainly the second one is solid and good, you know, good film. Uh, but it means in so many of them, like we, we, we've agreed, Kung Fu Panda 2 is the best one. Puss in Boots, second one is the best one. Shrek 2 is the best one of the Shrek movies. You know, isn't that interesting? It's like they kind of need I mean, two, they need sort of two swipes at it to kind of get it perfect. That's what I was saying at the start when I said that there's going to be a bit of a pattern. And a, a, just about <laughs> half of my list is legit DreamWorks sequels. Yeah. How to Train Your Dragon 2, Kung Fu Panda 2, Puss in Boots <laughs> Last Wish, Shrek 2, uh, or about give or take half. And yeah, like I would say more so than not, like their second film, somehow they're always the it's best. Interesting. Like that, that's yeah. usually not the case. Like most of the time, for most franchises, usually the sequels are are weaker than the originals, you know, in, in most in most things. So that it's very interesting that they have that pattern again and again. I like it. It's cool. Yeah, I, yeah, I would even say like even with some of their lesser franchises, it's kind of the same thing. Like, yeah, I personally prefer Boss Baby Family Business yeah. over the first one. Agreed. And I actually and I actually consider Trolls World Tour to be the best of the Trolls movies. Yeah, it's bonkers, but I, I can I can I can side with that. Um, all right. the first band together. I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> well, my uh, my next one is uh, is a very special movie. Uh, it is the Mitchells versus the Machines uh, is my wow. next pick. Uh, I love this movie. Uh, I absolutely love the characters and uh, the uh, the this family dynamic and uh, Katie coming to kind of understand her father um, and that her father really did sacrifice for her and loved her and it's the journey that both those characters have is beautiful and the whole family is wonderful and I love her and her brother I love that dynamic and their friendship and and uh and uh, and then all the sci-fi stuff is just like fun uh, you know the the robots the and uh the 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 various obstacles they face along the way um I think that Olivia Coleman makes her a pretty good evil robot uh and that's fun the animation is absolutely beautiful I love it and uh yeah this was one of those ones that kind of got me through the pandemic uh I love this movie I wish I could see it yeah, on the big you know, screen. Oh, uh, yeah, it's too yeah, it's too bad. Sony had to sell a bunch of their films to Netflix, and I heard rumors they're st- like they got a bunch more they're giving it to them. Uh, but um, I will say one thing that not many people often talk about, but like this is this might seem like a crazy theory, but I feel like with the Mitchell source of the machines, this is the closest that we have in terms of having a Gravity Falls movie. Especially yeah. when uh, the director and the writer, yeah, especially when the director Mike Rianda and the writer Jeff Rowe, whom, well, technically we've already talked about his movie with Mutant Mayhem, um, they've already, like, they were they, they were prominent players uh, during Gravity Falls. And yeah, like, a lot of that humor, a lot of that style, like, it is very prominent in here. And I mean, I love Gravity Falls. I think it's easily one of the best shows from Disney. And having that style be adapted into a feature film, it actually works out. Now, I won't say that it is like one of the best animated features for me because, like, the plot line, it's very much, it's almost like a copy of the goofy, uh, of a goofy movie. And then you add in an element of Terminator into it. But, uh, and that, and also, like, I'm not the biggest fan of Katie Mitchell. Like, there are some things where I feel like it's, like, some of her things that she would do was a bit mean-spirited and selfish. Oh, really? Uh, but still- I love her so much. Like, I love her movie making and and uh, and how creative she is. And, yeah, she does have conflict with her dad. But uh, but they they make up, a, you know, well enough for me, I guess. But um, but yeah, I can see that. I mean, it's it's hard to do those teenage characters. They can be kind of. It's always hard to like w- walk that line. And if, if people are interested, I actually got to interview Mike Rianda after this movie because I enjoyed it so much. Um, for Rotoscopers, and I got to sit and talk to him about it. And and uh, and uh, yeah, I I I think that it's just such a like. I just related so much to the dynamic between Katie and her dad. And I, I think that's something that a lot of girls kind of have that journey with their dads and um, kind of trying to understand them. And they feel like they're almost a different language uh, than, than, uh, yeah. than you have. That, but, um, could, that could explain it. Uh, like, at least for you that you liked it more like mm-hmm. uh, that, 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 but I totally understand it and it makes yeah. sense. And I mean, it still doesn't change that the, the characters are still great. I love the dad. And, and the mean, dog is so brother. cute. Oh, I love the dog. The dog. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> It's so funny. Of, <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, it's a pig, little for bread. Pig, pig, pig. <laughs> it's like, what is it? Oh, yeah. No, but yeah. like, definitely, yeah, like one of those films that, like, it it managed to work at, like, what it tried to do, it's great. And a lot of hilarious, great, hilarious moments, uh, but also heartfelt as well. Like, and very similar to a goofy movie, but also hits the same right notes as a goofy movie. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I really wish it had won the Oscar that year. I think it was the best of the nominees, but alas. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm all right. I I, I really like Encanto. I, I, I would vote for it, so. I like Encanto too, but I don't know. I just, I love Mitchell's. Um, okay, uh, what do you have next? 
Well, my next up, we might as well get back into this conversation. I actually have Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, with many of the other sequels, for me, I feel like with this one, like the first Spider, the first Spider-Man movie that or the first uh, Spider-Verse movie, they set the bar extremely high. Uh, and with the sequel, not only have they managed to succeed to be as good, but I feel like it managed to find ways uh, to really step it up and even make it more engaging, more intense, and deliver us more of what they have established in the first feature and just leave us in absolute awe. You already got the first, yeah. like, you already got the elements that they worked at, you know, that they build greatly in the first, but then with the second feature, they actually um they actually leveled it up with not just different you know like not just with different styles uh for the characters but also sending us to completely different worlds like creating different universes uh that have their own distinct style and then like, now you have like literally hundreds and hundreds of different Spider-Man characters like I I said in my review this is very much the Who Framed Roger Rabbit of Spider-Mans because um, like you got so many different Spider-Mans respecting their own unique style, whether it be uh, from the comics or uh, from the cartoons or from any other adaptation or even like the toys uh, that like they would have their own highlight. Yeah, that was fun. But like, all, like so many different Spider-Mans are all represented uh, in this world. And I understand that yeah, it could go a little too exposition heavy. And I do agree. Like one little fault of it is that it could be a bit too on the, on the nose, especially when going into the canon and stuff like that. Uh, but still though, uh, what I do find great as well is also looking into the, like the additional dynamic of Miles Morales and his relationship with Gwen Stacy, uh, Gwen Stacy, where after the experience that he went through uh, in the first film, like being reunited with Gwen and then like you see the complex dynamic of the romance that they have. It's like almost a, a forbidden love that they would go and experience and also um, go and also having a strong message of what it means to be Spider-Man. And it, it kind of has this um, this commentary in terms of fandoms where they would go and try to establish the rules and like this is very uh, like and this is honestly something that i'm glad that a movie finally is calling out this whole thing but this um uh, this like pretty much calling out gatekeeping and the problems that come with it where with miles he wants to go and break the status quo that is established from the franchise but then like you would have a uh, spider-man 2099 uh a miguel o'hara trying to go and establish that status quo and pretty much opens up to why is it important to go and you know sometimes like you gotta break tradition you gotta you know you have to like have that leap of faith to go and try something new and especially in in this day and age of fandoms and gatekeeping and then like you would have these hate groups like comic gate and gamer gate and all that kind of like idiotic nonsense from white nationalists like it's great that we have a movie that is that that's not afraid to stand up and like to call uh, that kind of toxicity out. So like yeah. that I find to be fantastic, and not to mention that we are I I believe we are talking about the possibly the longest running Western animated movie going in at two hours and 20 minutes, but still making it engaging throughout and making the action scenes so intense. Like, oh my God, like I was blown away with the whole battle with uh, the Renaissance Vulture. And then suddenly the title appears. It's like, holy crap, we're starting. And then like, we got more action scenes happening. And then that ending, I'm not going to go into it, but oh my God, the, honestly, it is the most shocking plot twist I have ever seen in a movie. Like I was just stunned at the end of the feature. Like I thought like that whole chase with Miles and all the other Spider-Mans, that would be it. But then suddenly we see that moment occur, like the events that would happen afterwards. And I'm just left in shock. I was like, Oh my God. What? <laughs> like, honestly, it's that, like, I think it's legit a, a feeling that can be comparable 
to when Darth Vader tells Luke that he is his father. Like, it is that effective. So, yeah, honestly, for me, I have to, like, I know with both Into the Spider-Verse and Across the Spider-Verse, very admirable films. But for me, I got add Across so far. Like, I know yeah. the story is still continuing with Beyond. When that's going to be coming out, God knows when, hopefully when Lord and Miller knows how to how to treat their animators better. But we'll, 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 we'll see. But, yeah, like, with Across the Spider-Verse, they did amazingly. Yeah, it was a special film. It's something you'll never forget. And uh, they're all just, they're both just masterpieces. Uh, yeah, I actually got to interview uh, Mike Lasker, who is the head of VFX uh, for Across the Spider-Verse. And that was really fun to kind of get the inside scoop on the on uh, on the making of the movie and the look of it and everything. And, and uh, yeah, it's a special film for sure. Uh, We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. It's the Hallmarkies Merch Store. Are you looking for that perfect gift for the postable, hardy, or hallmarky in your life? What about getting that t-shirt or hoodie that will help you stand out at your next holiday party? Now is the time to check out the Hallmarkies merch store. Full of festive designs by artists like Jessica Miller, Carrie from Hallmark Comics, and more. You can even have more than just shirts, but totes, cell phone cases, notebooks, mugs, and more. And it isn't just Hallmark. We have designs for Anna Green Gables, Man from Snowy River, The Nanny, and more. Every purchase at the merch store goes to help support the podcast and allows us to make the great content you know and love. There are frequent sales, so go to tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies or see the link in the description. That's tpublic.com slash stores slash Hallmarkies. Well, and the next I actually have the Lego movie, but we already talked about that. Um, and so then, uh, and I realized that like I'm going... Um, from the bottom of the alphabet up and you're going from the top of the alphabet. Anyway, we we didn't plan we this out so order. well. But um, so next I have Claus. Um, uh. Claus. And I love, I'm obviously, I'm a big Christmas person, Christmas movie person. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to probably enjoy this, but I loved, uh, loved the animation and I end up really loving the story. You see, uh, you see this basically Santa Claus Claus character come from this low place and through serving other people, he, uh, he becomes this new person literally. And, and, uh, and then you also see the whole town as they start actually serving each other and start writing these letters and start being about something more than just their own misery that you see, not only do they start to come alive as people, but like the whole, I love that way that the, the whole film just becomes lighter and lighter and lighter as the movie progresses. The, the, uh, the way that it uses shading and color and, and, uh, and that you see the progression of, of this character. I love the animation. I, I, and I just love the story. I think it's such a great origin story for Santa Claus. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Now suddenly my memory just came back into what was the conversation about our debate again about if it's a CG film or not? Yeah, this is uh, the big one that we were talking the about. One. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think I'm gonna. Yeah, I think I'll I'll let the uh, comments decide if that's a yeah. CG film or or, or not. Or two D. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not every day that we would have an animated Christmas movie or even one that really does stand out as something that really got a lot of people talking. But when it came to Klaus, um, it really is one that stands out that it shows a lot of heart and shows like what Christmas means. And not to mention kind of reinventing the lore of Christmas of like who, you know, of who is Santa Claus how do how do you know how how did Christmas come to be and stuff like that? And in a way, it's kind of like a reimagining of Santa Claus is coming to town. Like we all remember the classic story with Rankin Bass and stuff like that. But with mm -hmm. this one, they decided to go and take a, a brand new step where they would also have this uh, postman be involved. Now, I will admit, and this is probably my hot take, I'm not the biggest fan of Klaus. Not to say it's a movie, it's solid, 
Um, there are just some things that kind of bother me a little bit. Like um, the main character, like with the postman, I just feel like he he feels like a bit of a knockoff of Cusco from The Emperor's New Groove, where like, you know, he's this very privileged brat that, need, you know, that has to go through this journey in order to learn to be uh, more, you know, to be more uh, open, to be more selfless and, and stuff like that. So that, that's so, fair. Yeah, He's an archetype. I mean, but I, I think it's executed pretty well is his transformation for me, at least. And, um, you yeah, know, I think, enough. yeah. And um, the relationship between the the girl and her, like it, the fish. Oh, what she's like. oh yeah. <laughs> I love that. So no, funny. But, but but I will say one thing that more than makes up for it is the character of Klaus. Like when you learn mm -hmm. about his story and why he creates to, uh, creates toys and why he is a recluse. Uh, you know, like, it, like it's one of those very rare movies that kind of makes you rethink about who is Santa Claus. Like, it makes you, you know, it kind of makes you, uh, like, it, it kind of makes you question, like, the definition of who is Santa Claus and what his backstory is. And, some, and like, one of the very rare moments where they're not afraid to go into a little bit of tragedy into the into his story like why he would go and keep making these toys and why he would do what he would do especially with his uh long lost wife so and, and not to mention the performance from jk simmons i know he like this guy mm. loves to do voice acting yeah. but in this case here uh i think like honestly it's definitely one of his uh, better performances and that's another mention, one i uh, wish it had won the oscar i think it was the better movie but yeah you know. Oh well. Um, oh well. What do you have uh, but, next? Oh, oh, okay. Oh, we're already going there. Well, oh, sorry. technically, this is uh, no. Well, just one more thing I want to add is also the comedy. The comedy yeah. I find to be fantastic, especially like uh, with the you know, especially playing with the different personalities with the, with the villagers in there. Uh, honestly, like it really adds into the fun and adds into the lightheartedness and really like playing a lot with the mood of like uh, of turning this grumpy hate filled town into this uh this joyous place of sharing so just want to quickly yeah. add that about klaus yeah. uh anyway um i actually only have one more movie left and mm -hmm. for me that is actually i got a very this is my most interesting edition waltz with bashir and mm -hmm. with waltz with bashir this is a, this uh, I personally find it to be a very innovative movie because this is an animate uh, an animated documentary, and at the time it uh, like at, at that moment, it, it's next to impossible to hear about a documentary that's being told in animation. I mean, like yeah, there are some there is animation that is often used in documentaries, but not like this. Not Did you like say that was CG though. I would say, I mean, because yeah, it's rotoscope, it's, it's hard. I debated because I thought about also putting um, uh, Apollo 10 and a half um, uh. on my list, which is also rotoscoper. Um, hmm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a, no, it's very interesting film. It's not really, yeah, it's, it, like, it, it is, it's more of a stylized CG. It's, it's mm -hmm. reminiscent to uh, Nimona, but I, I don't know, I don't think it's actually used. Uh, well, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'm just going to say, like, you could have included it. I mean, I just talked about Tintin. Just keep that in mind. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So, but anyways, going back with uh, Waltz with Bashir, yeah, they would use, yeah, like, it is very rare that we would ever see an animated feature or that, that, or that we would see a documentary use animation as its primary storytelling medium. And we kind of go through uh, the story of this filmmaker trying to recollect his memory that he has suppressed uh, about his time in the war. And mm -hmm. slowly but surely, like, we uncover about what it is, but then we realize, yeah, no, it is suppressed for a very good reason. Because some of the moments that happen there, yeah, they are indeed tragic. I mean, we are talking about the subject of war and how it can really psychologically affect someone in a pretty harsh and like frightening way. So in, in a way it kind of blends in with uh, like, it, it, I, I feel like with this movie, it's a beautiful blend of artistry and reality where on one hand we do see from his perspective 
about the whole about like what has happened where with what he and his friends went through in this war but at the same time the reality of what has occurred can also kick in and how it slowly dawns on and it slowly dawns on you about how of what happened and some of the things that he has done that yeah they can be horrific and that they can come with some dark consequences as all wars would and yeah, like it is uh, definitely one of the heavier, uh, one of the heavier movies that's on our list, but it is definitely worth a watch. And I feel like this, re- like just like with uh, Into the Spider Verse, this I feel like really set a new standard for documentaries that you can go and actually use animation as a legitimate medium to go and tell your stories. And yeah. there have been some other ones that Flea. have done the same thing. Yeah. Flea, another wonderful example uh, that 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 yeah. is worth you know that's worth including as like one of the yeah. best G- phenomenal film right there. Yeah. Um, and, and I know there's not many others, but hopefully more will come soon. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's an interesting pick. Um, so the next one on my list would be How to Train a Dragon, but uh, but since we talked about that, um, so my last one is uh is actually a, another Christmas movie because I love Christmas movies. Um, it's Arthur Christmas. I think it is one of the more underappreciated films, uh, animated films. If we were doing underrated, which we probably should do one of these days, um, I would definitely have Arthur Christmas on that list. Uh, it you know it has the look and feel of stop motion because it's got that Ardman aesthetic to it, but it is CG, and uh, I I just love Arthur as a character. Uh, I I I think maybe as a second uh, second child I could kind of relate to his dynamic of kind of looking and and wanting to just wanting to please people and and um and uh, the his sincerity and how uh con- how concerned he is you know, with the, with the girl, with the missing toy and, and, uh, how, how shocked he is that every, that, you know, and what I like about his brother is that he's not like a bad dude. He's just, he's just got this system and he's, he he thinks this is the best way to kind of do things. And, and he's lost the heart and soul, uh, that you need for the North pole. And, uh, and so then Arthur comes and reminds him of that. And, uh, it's just it's just a really good Christmas story. It's a really good movie. And uh and um yeah. Yeah, admittedly it's one of those movies that it's been quite a while since I've seen, but I completely understand of why Arthur Christmas like does have its fan base, of why it's beloved. Now for me I will say uh, there is a part of me that is bothered by Arthur Christmas, especially with the designs of how everybody has like the the smallest beady eyes that you could find like honestly like if they could go and redesign those eyes that you know it would probably help the movie but other but than isn't that, that kind of giving it the ardman look it sort of gives it that sort really. of st- that stop not motion really. kind of look i no, i don't know i feel like it would be a bit more keen to something like nick park you know like it like the eyes would be more bigger and closer to each other and like their mouths would be much wider as well. Mm. You know, I, I don't know. We would have a more Wallace looking Arthur <laughs> if, if it would be more true to the Ardman style. But um, anyways, uh, with, with Arthur Christmas, that, that's like my only major complaint with it. Other than that, though, again, just like what, what I mentioned with Klaus, it is a film in which that it really does reinvent the lore of Santa Claus, and especially now showing it as this... Uh, generational role that uh every you know that it's you know it goes down to like each descendant and um it, it's pretty much this movie that discusses about uh mo- you know the the balance between modern and tradition where you do have the brother that enters in that makes Christmas a lot more high tech and makes it a lot more efficient to go and deliver all the presents and to keep the flow going for every year but then Arthur would go and come in and he holds the traditional spirit of Christmas, of what it means to be Santa Claus, what it means to deliver gifts to children and to bring them joy. And that's why with this whole trip, it's about like giving this one bike to a little girl. And like yeah. at first it may not sound like much, but like it, it like more and more you learn about like why is it so important? Why? is very meaningful for each child having each of these 
unique gifts. And especially, I think like the most impactful moment that for me, when, when, when you would talk about Arthur Christmas, the most memorable scene is when that, it's like at the end, when that girl legitimately has that bike, when she opens up her present, and then, like you see all the other Santas, like you see Arthur, his brother, and the grand, and, and, and like the crazy grandpa, like they look and see her reaction when opening up, and you see the reactions of like the joy that she legitimately has, and it's such a heartfelt, tender moment where like they are seeing firsthand what Christmas is ultimately all about. So yeah, honestly, it's a great, you know, honestly, I, I feel like yeah, this is a film that should become a, tr a a Christmas tradition. Yeah, maybe I'll personally have like my criticisms here and there, but I'm not going to deny that it definitely is uh, a wonderful and touching Christmas movie. Well, since I did it kind of out of order, let me just go over my top 10 as far as the order. Uh, and so I had number one, I have Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Number two, I have Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Number three, I have Klaus. Number four, I have How to Train Your Dragon. Number five, Arthur Christmas. Number six, The Mitchells versus The Machines. The Number seven, The Peanuts movie. And so those are the seven that are in my top 50, right? So then these three, uh, The Lego Movie, I have at eight. Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Mutant Mayhem at nine. And Mr. Peabody and Sherman, I have at 10. So that's the, right. the order. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh Thank you so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. I love talking about these films. It is just such an exciting time to be an animation fan. I, I it's it's I think the most exciting moment for the medium since uh the Disney Renaissance. I really do. I believe that. Oh yeah, like every yeah, like all these studios, rather it be Disney, Pixar, um DreamWorks, Sony, what mm -hmm. have you like they're, they're really putting on their a game so far yeah. and i mean all these studio i know like these studios like they'll they'll have their ebb and flow and some like some amazing moments and some not so good moments but like yeah like we're like when when these studios are, when when all these studios are strong like oh boy do they like they really go all out yeah 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 well so how can people follow you your content everything you do uh, well, for me, well, the main thing that you can go and find me is on YouTube with Electric Dragon 505. And as for everything else, whether it be uh, Patreon, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, or Blue Sky, you can find me as Animat or Matt Brune Animat. Great. And you can find me at Rachel's Reviews all over social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. And also, I'll put the playlist for all of my top 50 uh, episodes including all of our episodes together so you should check that out and uh, check out the hallmarkies podcast if you want more of my christmas content and uh, and also uh, if you are listening on itunes please leave your ratings and reviews really appreciate that and if you are watching on youtube please give the video a thumbs up subscribe to the channel appreciate that so much also have patron group and merch store where you can get hashtag animation junkie shirts check that out and uh, thanks so much we'll talk to y'all later bye